everyone. It's Melody Johnson with Elite Expert Insider Podcast. We're so happy to have you here today. So we have a special guest. His name is Dan Stein or Daniel Stein. And oh my gosh, he's just really an interesting guy. He's he has been with the, I want to say he's the president of the Young Presidents Organization. He teaches, he is talking about leadership, and we are going to go over his book, which I find really interesting, Conquering Your Mountains, Solving Problems Through Innovation Leadership. So join us today. Thanks, Dan, for coming. Hi, Melanie. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And by the way, my my email is Dan Stein, S-T-E-I-N, but my full name, I wish my parents would have had a shorter name, is Steininger. So, so my email is Dan Stein, but my actual full name is Dan Steininger. Either way, I'm happy to be here and, and I enjoy, I look forward to an interview by you because you guys do. Thank you. Job. Yeah. I see on your book, it's Daniel Thank Steininger. You. And then all the things, communication we got was Good just enough. Dan Stein. So I love that you have, you like have two names. You could be incognito. Never <laughs> work. I've been called a lot of names, so don't worry. I love that. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background. About yourself and... Uh... We think that what I'd like to say to the listeners, why would you listen to this podcast today? I think that's the most important part because you guys have always have very good experts when you when they speak. IBM did a study a few years ago. What's the most sought after quality in business leaders today? And what came through is the their ability to be creative or innovative. Now, that doesn't come as a shock when we've had the big jobs and Elon Musk. But when I'm here to help those who are on the podcast, by listening today, I'm going to give you some tips on how to be an innovative, creative leader. What do you have to do to be creative and innovative? So I've got five tips. If they listen through, by the end, they can start lead, lead, leading a more creative life and solving some of their problems through innovation. So that's what I want people to know with their get out of this podcast. All right, well, let's dive in then. Let's go with your first tip. Okay. So let me just step back and say, why do I focus on this? Okay, go back in the day when I was young. I, my home base is in Milwaukee. I'll have a winter home in Phoenix, Arizona. But I used to, during my college years, hop a freight out of Milwaukee, or train out of Milwaukee to go to Glacier National mm -hmm. Park. And you come across the plains of Montana, eastern Montana, early morning because it's an overnight trip. And they're very, you know, they are plains. They're just dry and, and arid. And all of a sudden, you see the Rocky Mountains coming out of the out of that high plain desert area and it's spectacular. And you train comes into the train station in East Glacier Park, Montana, next to Glacier National Park. And you get out of the train and you're smelling the mountain air and you're having your, for those who know John Denver is, your John Denver moment. It's a wonderful experience. But while I was there working in the park, I had I, a couple of weeks later, I started reading a book by Lewis and Clark. Now, what did you think Lewis and Clark thought when they saw those mountains as they were heading toward the Pacific? Yeah. Whoa. Those yeah. mountains are barriers that we've got to get around or we're never going to make it to the Pacific. And if they didn't, Oregon, Washington, and maybe even California would be owned by other countries. So they got around it. And of course, they had to. And how do you get around mountains? You do it. Well, they found a mountain pass. You found ways of getting through it, around it. They, of course, picked a woman, <laughs> a Sacagawea, who had grown up in that area. And she navigated them through to the coast so they could get to the Pacific Ocean. So bottom line for all the listeners. Look, if you're a normal human being, we're faced every day with opportunities, yeah. you want to call it, whether it's personal or professional. And what I'm here to tell people, here's some tips. And if you follow them, you'll be able to solve your problems. So that's what it's all about. So there we go. If, and if you don't have any problems and you have no challenges in your life, well, tune out and go have Well, let me fun. tell you, you're, you're talking about not having problems. So here in Houston, in the last 45 days, we had pretty much a tornado. And then a hurricane. So life just throws you lemons, whether you're running a good, smooth life or not. And to your point, I was out in last spring hiking in around Phoenix, and our climate is much like Houston. Um, but it's a hot day. I was hiking along a trail, and I heard I heard a rattle. And seconds later, I hit by a rattlesnake. Oh. And I turned around, and he slithers by. I wanted to whack him with my hiking pole, but uh, I decided not to, which I'm glad, because I learned later that rattlesnakes can keep biting you. So anyhow, call the call 911, emergency vehicles come out, the responders and so forth. Eventually I get helicoptered into the to the emergency room. But what I did is let them know that, you know, I've been bitten by a rattlesnake. So they brought the and I've had them with them because it can be very dangerous. The better. So they started putting me in it on the oh by the way, the helicopter pilot came out 
and introduced himself. He said, hi, I'm Captain Kirk. <laughs> I said, you're Captain Kirk. If you're Captain Kirk today, I'm having on the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Anyhow, the point is when I eventually got to the emergency room that got the antivenom in me, it was always, already put in me when I was on the helicopter. So fast forward many weeks later, and I'm, the, I'm in Sky Harbor Airport. It's the big Phoenix airport. And people are coming up to me and saying, how's your rattlesnake bite? He said, this is City 5 million. How do you know about my rattlesnake bite? Oh, you were on the evening news. You're the first person that got antivenom out in the field. And therefore, they've changed all their procedures. So you never know. On a nice day, you're out hiking on a beautiful thing. All of a sudden, a rattlesnake bites right. you. Now, if you're in Houston, you get hit by a herd. They all have problems. They may be personal. They may be small. But the key to all of this is how do you navigate it to get to, to creative solutions? Let me begin by saying, people always ask me, um, are you born creative? And I say, all of us are born creative. Now, that may be a shock to you. It may to everybody. But I ask your listeners, if you've had children or grandchildren, um, have you ever remembered when they, you know, were young, um, did you have to tell them to learn to crawl? Did you have to tell them to try to walk? Did you have to bribe them? No, they did it naturally. Just tried to mm -hmm. crawl and then they would try to walk. And I always ask them, what's the most important thing they've done? And it's all over by five. They've learned to speak. Did you ever have to tell kids, if you speak, if you don't learn to speak, you're not going to yeah. humor little children. So how do we go about getting back to that person we were mm -hmm. when we were young, where creativity came in? Yeah. All right. So let's start because we're, most of your listeners focus on business and their professional lives. The number one thing you need to do when you're faced with a rattlesnake or a flood or a problem at work or a product you need to innovate, whatever, is begin by asking, okay, we have a problem. Spend the time to understand the problem. Americans, all Americans are shoot ready. Mm -hmm. aim. You know, we want to jump to conclusion. I'm saying, no, we don't want to do that. You want to step back and say, what caused this problem? How did I get into this mess? Or what caused the situation mm -hmm. we're in? Now, that's very counterintuitive to what we think that business people or leaders should be. They're supposed to know the mm -hmm. answers, right? Well, I'm telling you, the most important and good leaders embrace uncertainty, meaning they say, I don't know the answer. I'm going to spend my time to understand the problem, how mm -hmm. I got there. I always say, you take little kids. You, the child comes at you and says, Dad, can we have a monkey? Yeah. I say, uh, well, and you tell them that. He say, oh, well, why? And this goes on. And then, well, this and that. And then, why? Well, little kids will ask side times, why? So when you have that problem, step back and ask yourself, mm -hmm. why? Five times. Why? Did, how did I get into this solution? How did I get mm -hmm. here? The more you spend time understanding the why of how that problem occurred, the better off you're mm -hmm. going to be. It's called developing a habit of confident humility. You know you're going to solve it, but you're going to need the help of others to get the mm -hmm. problem solved. So, so there you go. That's the start of it. Tip number one, don't rush to solution. Don't rush to ideas. Spend the time. And keep asking. Those and I like that at any age, you can be creative. It doesn't matter if you're 60, Precisely. you're 70, you're 80, or even 90, you can still be creative. So I love that. And but Melanie, let me ask you, why, what happened to us that we were such real creative little kids? We were, and all of a sudden, as we get to be adults, we don't naturally do creative things. What, what do you think? I think we kind of get, we get put into happen? a box and then fear of judgment of other people. Like, oh, you didn't do that right. Oh, well, I'm never going to do that again. You know, in school for creative answers or for getting the right answers, yeah. right? So our school system actually demand that we memorize things and have the right answer rather than come up with options. You can't tell your math teacher, well, I don't think two plus two equals four. I think it's something else. And then when we get to the work, world of work, what happens? Yeah. Just as you said, you know, your boss isn't telling you to come up with something creative. And if you do, even you feel, wow, you, we tried that. Yeah, that you're afraid work. of getting the no. So again, we learn yeah. to conform. So let's, let's jump to the second one. Okay, number two. All right, once you have all of the problems, the causes, what, I make a little diagram. What are all the causes of this problem? What do you think all those things happen that cause this problem? I don't know if it's, who knows what it's going to be, but list them in order. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Give an example. It was a company. The president called a meeting. The budget people said, we need to spend four to five million. to. It was a huge office tower. And at five o'clock, there was lines. And people had to wait forever for elevators. So they proposed spending millions to build another elevator shaft. 
so we wouldn't have to wait forever. Ice, why do we get this problem? Well, what they found out is that many of the office tenants in the building, some other companies, everybody left at five o'clock. Well, once they knew that, the partial time was five o'clock. Maybe that led to some creative mm -hmm. ideas. Well, maybe we should stagger the times people leave. And guess what? They staggered the times of departure between those companies and oh, never had to spend the millions on another elevator mm -hmm. shaft. So my point is, put down the causes of the problem. Let's say your car doesn't start. Okay. Well, do I have the fob in my <laughs> pocket? You know, or then you look at the gas tank. Is it a gas tank? Maybe the battery isn't hooked up. You just go through a list of things that, why isn't this mm -hmm. car starting? Uh, maybe it's not in park. You know, I mean, I've got it in neutral for some reason. So you have to decide what's the number mm -hmm. one cost. So you make up a little chart. It's named after a, an Italian mathematician called Prado, developed it years ago, called the Prado chart. And what's the number one cause? So that's what you have to figure out. What's the number one cause? It's Lewis and Clark. They looked at the mountains and said, huh, our problem is the mountains. You know, okay, now we know we got to somehow, our problem is we got to get around these mountains or through them or we're never going to get to the Pacific yep. Ocean. So they knew they had to scale those mountains, find a mountain pass where they weren't going to get through. Because you can't go over them. They're too high. 10, 12,000 feet. There's snow a lot of times on the top. So so that's tip number two is go through and systematically rank in order those problems that causes of the problem you're facing. This is not scientific. Yeah. but it's I like helpful. it because, you know, as you're listing the reasons why listing, you can be uh, an innovative to find the solutions that, you know, maybe cost you the least amount of money that are the most simple to do. Let me give you an example. True story. When I, I was a lawyer, I was a lawyer. I say I'm a recovering lawyer, but I'm a CEO of a large company and then actually both public and private companies by way of background. So I've been in leadership roles a good part of my life. But I was researching this in law school. It was a case in out of the San Francisco District Court. The, the uh, airport in San Francisco is right... And a beautiful, on a beautiful sunny day, Japan Airlines, the captain was Captain Oso, was flying into the San Francisco airport and he put the plane down about a mile short of the runway, actually in the bay. The passengers, it was such a great lighting, didn't even know they were in the water until they looked out the window and saw sailboats going by. Now, this seemed, now you couldn't stop reading yeah. at this point. So, luckily, the plane was retrieved. No passenger lost their lives, so it turned out to have a good result. Nevertheless, the FFA... Did it have it? That's how I read about it. it. Was in the Federal Register. They called a meeting in the Federal District Court. They put Captain Oso on the witness stand. Said Captain Oso, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and so help you God. Yes, I do. You understand we're going to do an investigation. It's going to take six months, and we'll get the causes of how this happened. You understand? Yes, I do. So Captain Oso, what in your judgment is the reason this accident occurred? Um, and he's and this is right in the text. I cleaned it up a little bit. How you Americans say it? Captain Oso, screw up. <laughs> 15 minutes, the hearing was all over because he admitted that you didn't have to find any other. He made a mistake. Now, what I'm pointing out that as we look at this, sometimes we have, what have I done to create the problem? It's not easy to be yeah. so searching. Or you may ask friends or people yeah. you trust, colleagues, what am I doing that I may have caused this problem? Throwing that in, that honest evaluation will require you to say, Okay, maybe I contributed, and if that's true, it helps you figure the thing out. All right. And by the way, this concept will apply to opportunities. Let's say you're saying, maybe I should do another, maybe we should move somewhere else. Again, what are the barriers? Why would you want to do it? And that'll help. All right. Now we get, now we understand the causes in order of problems. Now we start what we call historically brainstorming. The most important thing everybody needs to understand is that even if you're at work, do not try to sit in a meeting and come up with the answer. And all the <laughs> ideas, what are all, yeah, the more ideas you come up with, the better. But here's the idea. Why not sit at work and figure? Here's the thing. I ask you, Melanie, where do you get, I mean, you're doing a cre very creative podcast. Where do your, when and where are you when your idea, the, your most creative ideas come to you in a given day? You know, usually... Yeah, usually my brain is working better in the morning when it's well rested. And then usually if I'm listening to something or having a conversation, it'll spark ideas about something. And then it gets the ball rolling. Perfect. Steve Jobs used to go mm -hmm. for walks. 
people will tell me, well, I, I came up with great ideas. Oh, yeah. Shower is my best thinking uh, time I, is I'm the shower. Swimmer. There the you shower. go. Absolutely. I'm a swimmer and I have to actually keep a notebook at the end of my swim lane. The only problem is early on, I learned if I wrote an ink and I would bring it back to the office and I would ask my assistants, what have I written here? This is really brilliant. But the water. You know, you know what you need? Bit. There's a thing called, I want to think it's called wet notes or shower notes. Yeah, and I ended up. Yeah, that you can write them when you're in the. Yeah, that are wet. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to get to the list, and I want you to understand this really profoundly. It's very hard to go into a meeting and come up with ideas in a work context. Most of the time, we have this brain up here, and in it is brain in the frontal cortex is a governor, I would call it, and that sees all the incoming information, advertisements, shows, podcasts, who knows what. Until you turn that off, your creative side mm -hmm. can't come up. So when you're in the shower or when you're doing an early morning thing, your executive brain is more rested. It's turned off. The subconscious starts to come up with. So we are, all over America, people are getting in the brain, driving me, oh, we got to come up with all these answers. The worst possible thing you can do, I say, look, share the problem, the causes with everyone else yeah. in an email. And say, between now and a week from now, start writing down some of your ideas, some of your solutions, whenever they come to you. You may be driving. You may be in a shower. You may be in a swimming pool. You may be walking. Who knows what? You may be talking to somebody else. and you're, Oh, they put an idea in my mind. Yeah. So start listing those ideas and send them to your fellow teammates. I say, put post-its up. Yeah. Put them on a refrigerator. And the Harvard Business School did a great study. I went to law school in Boston. At Boston University, I had a lot of friends at the Harvard Business School. So I went some classes over there. The more ideas you put in play, I say if you put 10 in play, you'll get two or three. If you put 50 in play, you'll get 20 or 30. The more ideas you can list, putting post-its up, get away from it, keep coming back. So when you eventually have your meeting, you will have, everyone will have some, everyone will have thought about some stuff so you can have a far more effective meeting and look at far greater number of solutions because some of the crazy, you know, I have a friend he was, his team was charged with coming up some unique adhesive to do something. They were at 3M in Minnesota. Big company. And just couldn't get it to work. But he noticed that the sticky material I created, it kept people, on, you left it on paper. You could stick those yeah. papers. And he said, well, maybe there's a product here. Maybe there's a product here. And we kept thinking, that was the birth of Postis. Yep. Billion upon billion yeah. dollar boats. Billions have been sold. So you just never know what ideas are going to. So again, don't rush to solution. A couple other tips about the brainstorming session. It's really important to use humor when you act your meeting. Now, why do I say that? Okay, imagine all of us are going back thousands of years to when we were running around the plains of East Africa and then Europe, and you didn't have emails, you didn't have, you didn't have text, you couldn't call anyone, you didn't have a mobile phone. So now you saw a group of people coming at you, and they have. And you don't know if they're friendly or enemies, and, and they can kill you. So what what did we do? So anthropologists tell us that people started developing signals. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might yeah. do a funny dance. They would create humorous ways of signaling to their enemies. I'm a nice person. Don't spear me. Okay? Now, what humor does in a meeting is it, number one, moves us from our left analytical brain, which we all are in our left brain right now, into your right creative brain. Humor moves you over there, and that allows you to think of ideas. Second, it reduces the politics. I mean, if you got your boss sitting there, if you're laughing together, you're more likely to be able to have to say things that you might not otherwise. It, it, one of my homes, if there's a crew from the city out working, they're doing something, and they'll, like if I'm in Wisconsin, I'll come out, and you, they're looking at my house, they're looking at me, I'll like, what's this guy like? You know, you're already me thinking, and here we are, common laborers. And I turn them out, I'll go up to them and say, did you guys watch the Green Bay Packers last night? Can you believe it? How could he throw that interception at the last minute? Two minutes later, we're all doing, we're best yeah. of friends. It's through class. Yeah. As you plan your brainstorming session, build in. It's not fine, hard to find humor. Just go to YouTube, you know, play some, get people laughing in these sessions. It's important. And so, oh, and one other important thing. And this is the importance of how you, when you actually have your brainstorming mm -hmm. sessions, it's important to understand that more than half of the American public is our introverts. Ah. 
Melanie, you are not an introvert. <laughs> Susan Crane wrote a book, and I suspect yep. John isn't either, called Quiet. And it's a very difficult problem. But in a, in a given meeting, you know, certain people will be talking up, dominating the mm -hmm. conversation. That's a problem because you're not hearing from the people True. who yeah. are introverted. For an example, Harvard did a, does a study every year in which you're given a hypothetical. You're in Alaska somewhere. Your plane crashes. You've got less than 10 hours or a few hours only to get everything you need to survive in the Alaska wilderness. And they film it. And afterwards, they were watching it, and they noticed one of the persons in the room, one of the students, was not saying anything. And they finally turned to him and said, why didn't you say anything during our brainstorming session? He said, well, you know, I tend to be a little shy. I don't like to. Oh, well, okay. So what do you think of what we came up with? And he said, oh, you won't live a, more than a day or two. Well, why do you say that? I was born and raised in the wilderness in Alaska. I know what you need to survive. That tells you everything about introverts versus, so in meetings, that's why communicating ideas through email, because then the introverts yeah. can speak up. But you'll to give them a that. platform. So that's just some tips. That's some just some tips. And again, you never know what's going to work. I like that you're saying um, to try the different things. So I like that. What a, Be able to open to try you, things. That's right. Know. What is the next tip that you have? In, or next step? And last thing I'm going to say about Next thing I'm going to say about it, when FDR addressed the nation at the height of the Depression after his election, he said, we are going to engage in bold experiments. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, I have the answers. We're going to try things. And people yeah. understood that. So, okay. Next. And by the way, your audience, and you know, I'm going pretty rapidly. I want to tell them that they can just go to LinkedIn. And it's Dan, think Stein. Think of a beer Stein. Dan Steininger, S-T-E-I-N-I-N-G-E-R. And... Click on it, and I have my bi-monthly news, newsletter with tips and creative things. You can get a lot of what I'm telling you yep. right there. Just and all yep. there, each topic is listed. Click on the newsletter; it's short and simple. Doesn't cost you anything, but you don't want to miss these because for that rattlesnake, it could have killed me, <laughs> and a hurricane can kill you in Houston. You want to be able absolutely. To solve problems. Well, we'll make sure like that they. Me. Know where to reach you. Let's get those other two tips in before the interview's over. Okay. All right. Now you've got all these ideas that are all on post-its. They're all over the place. How are you going to pick what you should do? What do you do? Now, here's really important. Let's pretend you're buying buy a new car. All right? Now, the most important thing, because every time you go to a dealership and you test drive a car, ah, that feels great. That's wonderful. Yeah. They all seem nice. How do you pick? All right. What you need to do is write down in order what's important. What are you looking for in that new car? Do you want fuel economy? Do you want the least expensive car? Do you want the safest car? Do you want, who knows? Put down all the criteria you're trying to achieve. Starting and then rank it. I want the least expensive car. No, I want one with great mileage. You list those things down in order and you weight each one. So the most important thing is Gas mileage or whatever. Five, that gets a five. Uh, the next thing is safety. That gets a four. You list all those weighted criteria. Oh. Then you put your car A, car B, mm -hmm. car C. And you rate each car on its expenses, whatever the five things you've chosen. And all you do at the bottom, and then add up the numbers. And you're going to see one or two are going to pop right to the top. Now, that's not yep. scientific, but it's an easy way of picking what things you're going to do. Um, now, I'm glossing over it, but a lot of times in doing this, before you make that decision, you can talk to customers. I'll give you yeah. a good example. There was a small company in Australia. They were trying to grow. They were not a wine, a new wine, because they had a wine that they mm -hmm. thought was good. What they did is they went to beer drinkers and mixed drinkers and asked them, why don't you drink wine? Well, it's kind of expensive and we don't necessarily like the taste and we don't even understand those labels, Appalachian control. What does that mean? You know, so they decided to pioneer a new wine, two kinds, red or yellow, price it better and make it. Guess what? That became the fastest growing wine in the history of the wine industry. And it's called Yellowtail. Oh, yeah. And if you've been in a grocery store or a wine shop, you will always yeah. see Yellowtail. True story. Oh, yeah. So as you develop your criteria, and you can check with customers if you're in business. What do they say? So now you've got figured out what it is 
you want to do and what car yeah. you're going to pick based on the criteria or the idea you're going to, because you've created a system, a discipline. And then the last thing is, once you think you've got the greatest idea in the world, it's important to have pushback. Let's say you've developed a new product, or I've talked to people, entrepreneurs, they've got this cookie they make and everybody likes their cookie. Well, their friends tell them that. Their relatives tell them they like their cookie. That doesn't mean customers out there who don't know you are going to like your cookie. So you've got to find ways of testing whether or not, however excited you are about it, um, you can find out from potential customers whether they really like it and will or sell. Otherwise, in the Pentagon, and sometimes in times of crisis or war, they create a murder <laughs> team. It's called a murder team. Literally, a group of people set up to attack the idea. Ah. What's wrong with it? And by the way, I'm going to give you a story that said in Texas. So here we go. Melanie, Texas. No, don't mess with Texas. Professor Jerry Harry, Harry who was at, taught at Washington, George Washington a University in D.C., the business school there. His wife was from Co Texas. Co Texas is in the panhandle of Texas, not too far. And they were there on a very hot summer day, about four o'clock in the afternoon. And you know what it's like in Texas. You can get hot. And they had the swamp cooler going, which is wet hay and a fan. And they're all sitting on the deck in, 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 of her parents' house. And, and granddad says, Well, you know, where do y'all want to go for dinner tonight? No one said anything. Well, you want to go to Abilene? And, and Jerry said, I turned to my wife and said, would you like to go to Abilene? And she said, well, Jerry, I'll do what you want to do. And then grandma starts tying her shoelaces. They all got into granddad's old Packard. No air conditioning. Went across the panhandle of Texas, which was dusty and hot. Yep. You can imagine. Yep. Went to this greasy spoon cafe in Abilene. Had their dinner. Was miserable. Again, back across the plains, Texas, to back to co Texas. They got home at eight o'clock at night. They sat on that deck in that porch for an entire hour. They were so miserable. Nobody could say anything. Finally, someone, why did we go to Abilene? And someone said, well, Grandpa, it's your idea. He said, I was just throwing things out. I didn't say I wanted to go. Jerry turns to his wife and said, well, honey, I thought you, no, honey, I thought you wanted to go. And then Grandma starts crying. Fast forward to the Watergate proceedings many years later when Sam Irwin, a, a graduate of my law school, and I was talking to Chuck Colson under oath in the proceedings to find out Watergate, why did it occur. Mr. Colson, at any point prior to the break in the Democratic quarters, did anyone say, this is probably a dumb idea? And he said, no. And what if they would have? Oh, we wouldn't have done it. How many of us have been on trips to Abilene in our lives? We took a journey and we did something. Why did I do that? Yeah. And then nobody said no. So even though once you've got that solution and this is where you want to go, think of ways you can find out, is it not right? Or am I, am I on a trip to Abilene? So it's all the, so you really got to find ways to push back against the idea you've fallen in love yeah. with. And that after that, if it gets by all that, you're good to go. You have now found your pass through, the, through Glacier National Park, which... And you're on your way to the Pacific Ocean. Oh, those so are great, great tips. I love all those. I wish I could expand on it more, but our time is up. Tell people again where they can reach you. Let's make it easy. Think of a beer stein, Dan Stein, and then I-N-G-E-R, Dan Steininger. And just go to LinkedIn, click on Dan Steininger, maybe two I-N's, and you will see posted there all of the bi-monthly newsletters I do. And there are creative tips. You know, read it once or twice a month. That's all it comes out. Doesn't cost you anything. But we, it will has the opportunity to save your life. You may not be bit by a rattlesnake, but other things are coming your way. We're all humans. This is going to give you ideas on how to respond in when these things occur. So so you can do that, and that comes free. And I, and, oh, and also, you know, you can just text me or email me on, or a message on LinkedIn. Perfect. Just email me. Say, here's a challenge I'm having. Here's a problem. I'm happy to get back to you and spend some time and cost you anything to talk about creative solutions. That's very us. generous of you. And make sure you pick up his book as well. It's on Amazon. So maybe you go and grab that as well. Conquering Your Mountains, Solving Problems Through Innovation. So join us next time. I hope you enjoyed this interview and have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Melanie. Take care. Hey, are you looking to increase your revenue, build credibility, and elevate your brand? This podcast is brought to you by Elite Online Publishing, an innovative publishing and full-spectrum marketing company. 
they will publish and market your book to make it a number one bestseller. Becoming an author is the best way to market your business. So contact them at EliteOnlinePublishing.com today. All of their authors become number one bestsellers.